But I wanted to dive on and to get into chemical bonding right, before we start thinking about the forces between atoms in more detail. We'll have a qualitatively walk through <coughs> uh, the principal types of bonding. Now they're all different in the sense that they, you know, they have different characteristics, but they all have things <coughs> in common. So, for instance, all of the bonds between atoms or molecules are electrostatic. In other words, they're all based on the attraction between positives and negatives. Absolutely every single one. They all, if you plot, you know, force between two atoms against the distance between them, the shape of that curve <coughs> is common to all pairs of atoms or molecules. <coughs> Right? The numbers on the axes will change, but the shape, the overall shape of the curve will stay the same. Um, so let's have a look at some in particular. The first one I wanted to pick out was, uh, was metallic. So in a metal, and you'll come back to this actually in stage three, I know this because I teach this stuff, uh, we will look at electrons in metal, metals in some detail. Uh, but when you bring metal atoms together, what makes a metal atom a metal atom, um, their outermost <coughs> electrons, one, two, sometimes three of them, will leave the parent atom and you know, become basically a sea of electrons, free electrons floating around in between. So this is the case for silver, which loses one electron in this process, for instance. Um, and we have a whole set now of positive ions and you know which are relatively static in their position we can still have a crystal structure associated with silver uh, but the electrons are now mobile they're moving around like a liquid like a fluid in fact uh, in between the two and what we end up with is our positive ions being attracted to whatever electrons happen to be around them at that moment of time, which are themselves attracted to other positive ions around them, right? And the whole thing sort of holds together on this basis. Right? Now, as we'll see in stage three, it's a little bit complicated to explain now. Um, the reason this happens is that actually the metal atoms can reduce their energy state. They can get to a lower energy state, a more stable state by doing this than by hanging on to uh, their electrons. And that's always going to be what drives chemical bonds. The end result is at a lower energy than the starting point. Right, and getting to low energy is one of these things that, um, that happens in nature. Right, everything is trying to get to its lowest energy state. Right? That's what happens to anything when you drop it. Right? It goes to its lowest energy state. It drops towards the centre of the Earth under the influence of gravity until it meets a barrier, right? which is the ground or whatever else it is in the way. Always trying to get to its lowest energy state. So this is what we've got then. We've got our positive ions, which are still in some regular arrangement, still not moving around, still not mobile. So exactly everything I've said about a solid, right? Fixed shape, all that sort of stuff. But we've got mobile electrons moving around like, if you will, uh, um, a gas in this system. And that's why these things conduct thermal energy so efficiently. It's why they conduct electricity so efficiently. Electricity is the easy one. Put a positive electrode one side and a negative electrode the other, and our electrons are suddenly going to stream towards the positive. There's a flow of electrons that is a current. That's what a current is. Thermal conductivity is very similar. Heat one end of, of this silver bar up, uh, and you make the positive ions jiggle around a little bit more for sure but they're all jiggling around a fixed position. The key thing is that you've added energy to our gas of electrons. So they're now moving much faster. And what they will do then is collide with other electrons, collide uh, and influence through that uh, the positive, other positive ion cores. And they will move 
that energy through the system accordingly and do so very fast because they are moving so fast. So that's, you know, that's the root of, of uh, thermal conductivity as well. There's some weird materials out there. I mean, going back to Dharma that we talked about yesterday as a peculiar material. Right, we talked about, I, I talked about hardness, I talked about number density of carbon atoms in Dharma and so on. One of the things that's very, very interesting about carbon is that, uh, in the form of diamond at least, is that it's a fantastic insulator. <coughs> it doesn't conduct electricity because it has no free electrons to move around. It's not metallic. It doesn't have this setup. But uh, it happens to have a very high thermal conductivity, which, given what I've just said, about where thermal conductivity in silver comes from should surprise you a little bit. And the reason, again, is because we've got so many carbon <coughs> atoms packed into whatever volume we're talking about. And they are so rigidly held together. So if you make a carbon atom on one side vibrate a little bit more because you put some heat energy in, it moves that through the system really effectively because it is so tightly held by all the other carbon atoms around it. Um, so diamond is actually being used now as a, as a heat sink in electronic circuits. It doesn't mess up the circuit because it doesn't conduct, but it will get heat out of your large circuit very, very efficiently. In fact, more efficiently than anything else you can imagine. So it's fantastic for that point of view. So people are actually developing, well, they have developed now, actually growth techniques for growing thin films of diamond during the fabrication of a, of a circuit. Um, okay, moving on. Um, ionic bonding is the next one. <coughs> Again, very, very common one. We've, we've actually talked about this uh, a, a little bit yesterday. I introduced the concept um, when we were looking at ions. A common example is sodium. And again, this is going to its lower energy state. So you take a sodium atom, you take a chlorine atom, and you put them together. They can reduce their combined energy by the sodium donating one of its electrons to a chlorine atom. Right? And what we end up with, if you remember back to yesterday <coughs> when I said that um, each shell in our simple model of the atom has a maximum number of electrons that it can pack into it, that can pack into it. We minimize the energy if the outermost shell is at that maximum number. So two for S, remember, six for P, and so on. So we can do that for sodium and for chlorine by switching one electron over. So now the sodium looks like it's got a form out of shell. It's now a sodium plus ion. And our chlorine minus ion now looks like it's got a full outer shell. It's got eight, which is an S plus a P in that case, two plus six. So we've reduced their energy state by putting them together, one giving our electrons to the other. And that's what gives us uh, salt. It's what drives the crystal structure <coughs> of salt. We've now got <coughs> positive and negative ions. So the positive is always going to attract the negative but repel the, the other positives. So our sodium chloride structure is always going to be plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus in three dimensions. And that's the crystal structure of salt, basically. It's driven by the fact that they form um, ions and cling together through something that's then called the ionic bond, right? Because one is now positively charged and the other is net negative charge. Um, so these are just pictures of the same thing, basically. Right? So here's our crystal structure of sodium chloride, uh, that blob centre right on the screen, and you can see that, as you would expect, we will have alternating positive and negative ions making up that structure. Covalent bonding is slightly different. We are still heading towards this process of reducing the overall energy of our atoms by producing something that approximates to 
fill out a shell of electrons. So in other words, hitting the maximum number of electrons that we can put in that shell. <coughs> right? But in a covert bomb, we're doing that by sharing electrons. So it's not the donation of, a, of an electron wholesale, which is what we had in the example of sodium chloride. Uh, it's actually now a sharing between them. So if we look at a simple uh, molecule here, organic molecule ethane, two carbon atoms and six uh, hydrogens. Um, carbon actually needs um, a total of eight electrons in its outer shell to be filled. Uh, but it's only got four. It's got a long way to go. <coughs> so that sh shell is actually half filled at the moment. So we can reduce its energy considerably uh, if now another carbon comes <coughs> along and they share a couple of electrons between them and then these other hydrogens, which only have one electron each, they need two to fill their first S shell. Um, and they share all electrons between them. So we end up with hydrogen atoms which have got a share of two electrons now and carbon atoms which in their outer shell have a share of eight. So it's not perfect as in filling the states up but it's definitely a lot lower in energy than uh, it was at the beginning. All right, so this type of bonding, this covalent bonding will happen uh, in that case. All right, and the air we're breathing is primarily made up of molecules where you know, atoms of oxygen, atoms of nitrogen <coughs> and so on are covalently bonded to one another. Now, both for ionic bonding and for covalent bonding, we are still talking about electrostatic <coughs> forces, it's still driven by charges, uh, and in both cases they're very strong bonds. It's actually quite tough once these atoms have come together and reduced their energy. We actually have to put in a corresponding amount of energy for every single bond in our solid material to pull them apart again. All right, so if you want to separate sodium and chloride, chloride ions in salt, you have to put in as much energy as they were able to shed in order to come together in the first place. And it's quite a lot come back to this in a more quantitative fashion later on. <coughs> but the same is true for covalent bonds. They're actually very, very strong, uh, very strong bonds. This is the other end of the scale. Van der Waals bonding is really very weak. <coughs> and this is what holds together atoms like xenon and neon and so on, uh, if you want to create the liquid form, for instance, the condensed form uh, of those gases. All right, now those of you who know your periodic table will know that xenon and argon and krypton and that whole uh, column actually already have filled outer shells. It's why they're over there on the right-hand side of the periodic table. They are very unreactive gases because of it. There is no advantage in energy terms for them to combine with anything else. So they're chemically quite inert. Don't take part in chemical reactions or anything uh, of the sort, right? unless you really force the issue. So why can you create liquid argon then? what's holding the atoms together in that case. You've had to take out a lot of energy to do it. We're talking about a really cold fluid here. Um, but what holds them together is something that is essentially uh, to do with the statistical nature of, of where electrons are at any moment in time. And in this case, for instance, this little diagram down at the bottom Imagine a moment of time when there is a slightly higher density of electrons on one side of our, say, argon atom compared to the other. Right? It's just a statistical fluctuation. 10 to the minus 15 of a second later, it'll be different. 
but for that short period of time, that femtosecond, one side of our argon atom is going to be negatively charged with respect to the other. Yeah? <coughs> and all, yeah, go on. Um, is it wrong to call it instantaneous dipole induced dipole bonding? Um, it's wrong in the sense that it's not instantaneous. The timescales are very short. Yes. Right? I've already quoted 10 to the minus 15 of a second, which is a typical sort of value. Uh, but it is exactly what you say. Right? I'm just going to describe it in the more prosaic terms that are used in the recommended textbook, so that it's consistent. But it is a dipole effect. Dipole simply means well, you can use it in terms of magnetism, all sorts of other things. But in terms of charges, it simply means we've got a plus side and a minus side. <coughs> That's a dipole. Um, so all we need then is another atom where that is true in the opposite sense. So here's our bigger electron density on this one. Here's our bigger electron density on this one. So by definition, this is relatively positive. And we get a weak attraction between the two. It's weak because, you know, we're talking about a fraction of the charge of an electron. We're just talking about there being more of them, uh, more charge, bigger fraction of our electrons on this side than on this side. So this is a very weak bond, right? And these bonds are made and broken and remade in the sort of time scales that I've already mentioned. So it's real, uh, it's measurable, but it is very, very weak. Um, there are variations on the thing, and these are quite important variations. So hydrogen bonding is one of them. Um, water is, is the preeminent <coughs> example, although there's, there's actually lots of other molecules where this, this occurs. Uh, but in a water molecule, <coughs> for instance, where we've got two different atoms involved. Specifically, we've got oxygen, which has eight protons, eight positive charges in its nucleus, and hydrogen with one. That sharing of electrons that I showed you diagrammatically in the context of, of ethane uh, a couple of sides back um, now becomes a little bit simplistic. Because actually, the hydrogen doesn't get its full share, as it, as it were, of, of two electrons. It actually gets somewhat less than its full share because there are more protons on the oxygen. So the oxygen actually grabs more than its fair share, if I can put it that way. So we end up with a water molecule <coughs> that is, um, well, I'll make it bounce, don't I? Um, we end up with a water molecule that is, relatively speaking, more negative near the oxygen and correspondingly more positive near the hydrogen. Right? Because the oxygen has actually pulled the electrons closer to its nucleus. Right? Now this is what sticks water together. Right, because what happens now is that we get another water molecule over here, and there will be a tendency for one of its hydrogens, which have a relatively positive charge, to be attracted towards this relatively <coughs> negative part of a neighbouring water molecule. <coughs> and this is why, when we freeze water, we get something that is of lower density than the liquid state. It's because we, we, we get an ordered crystal structure uh, that is based around these hydrogen bond uh, interactions, right? whereas in the liquid, there's still enough thermal energy for the water molecules to move past and bounce past each other. In the solid state, we've taken that thermal energy out, and the hydrogen bonding actually then takes over as the means of, of ordering the positions of these uh, of these molecules. All right, so this is the sort of stuff on this slide that we will get uh, in in ice. So we've now got this, this very ordered structure, and it's quite an open structure, right? Because we 
would force the water molecules to be in a particular orientation with respect to one another. And that's what gives us the expansion of ice uh, when it freezes. So it's actually, although weak, it is actually a crucially important form of, um, of bonding. 